Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us. We're just going to wait a few minutes to let people join the webinar and then we'll get started a little bit afternoon. Thanks for coming. Hi, if you're here for a webinar on student debt in Georgia, you're in the right place. We're just gonna wait a couple more minutes to allow some more individuals to join, thanks. It will go ahead and get started in a couple of minutes. I just wanted to say, first of all, if welcome, and if you have any questions during the webinar, feel free to use the Q&A function in Zoom. Um, we are going to have several points during the presentation when we pause and Jessica and I just chat about some of the information presented and also some of her experiences at the Scholarship Academy. So I'll take those times also to check the Q&A to see if there are any questions. So with that, I'll go ahead and get started. This webinar is being recorded today and we will send it out to all the registrants. So welcome. Uh, for those of you who don't know me or aren't familiar with the Georgia Budget and Policy Institute, my name is Jennifer Lee. I'm a senior policy analyst for higher education at the Georgia Budget and Policy Institute. And today uh, I have joining me Jessica Johnson from the Scholarship Academy, and I'll let her introduce herself and her organization a little bit. <laughs> Absolutely. Good afternoon. I'm always excited to talk about what's happening in the financial aid space for students across the state of Georgia. Jessica Donson, founder and executive director of the Scholarship Academy. We're a nonprofit that's based in the Atlanta metro area, primarily focused on making sure that low income and first generation families have what we call a college funding plan or a strategy so that they can enroll and graduate with the least amount of debt. And so we partner with schools and other nonprofit organizations organizations to provide advanced financial aid counseling. Yes, and Jessica and I were just chatting about um, a neat event she did last weekend that was a FAFSA drive through event where families could, could drive in and um, get help completing their financial aid applications for next year. So we're excited to have Jessica here. She's been a great partner of GBPI. And so I wanna introduce myself first by just explaining a little bit of what I do day to day. Um, what does a senior policy analyst for higher education do? That means day to day, I research policies and I analyze data and I talk to students all in service of making sure that we pass policies in Georgia that make it easier and for more students to be able to graduate from college or with another type of post-secondary credential. So um, all of the work that we do is in service of that. 
And today we're gonna talk about a hot topic. We're gonna talk about student debt here in Georgia. Let me advance my slide. Okay. So student debt is a very complex issue. Everyone has a story about student debt. If you or your family is not affected by it, you've probably heard stories or know someone who has been affected by it. And so that makes the issue, I think, even more challenging to discuss because there is such a variation in experiences with student debt and the burden that it can cause. So my goal today is to just provide some data and some research to help ground our conversation while still recognizing one of the key themes in student debt, which is that it is experienced very differently by individuals from different communities, particularly individuals of different races and ethnicities. So we're gonna dive into that today. I'm also gonna talk about a state student loan program, some ideas for policy solutions, and also a quick update at the end about what's going on at the federal level. And as I said, there are gonna be points during my presentation where I stop to talk with Jessica. So feel free to put your questions into the Q&A. So as part of my job, I said I get to talk to students. It's probably the thing that I like most about my job. And um, one of the very first questions I often ask them is why do you want to, why did you want to go to college? And students have a lot of different reasons that they tell me, um, but one of the consistent reasons that they include is that, that they want more economic opportunity for themselves and their families. Students are very aware that higher education is necessary in today's economy for them to get higher paying jobs, stable jobs, um, so that they can be financially stable in today's economy. And a lot of students also who might be a little older have worked and have maybe hit ceilings in their career or have lost jobs or seen people around them losing jobs and know that they want to get that post-secondary credential so they can have a little more stability in today's economy. I know there's a lot of <laughs> talk right now about hiring shortages and labor shortages for service worker jobs. Um, and all, while all of that is true, it is still true that individuals who have more education experience less unemployment um, in Georgia and all across the country. Unemployment rates are also higher for Black, Asian, and Latinx workers all across the country, even at similar education levels to their white peers. And it's important to note that even with reported labor shortages, the U.S. still has 5 million fewer jobs right now than we did pre-pandemic. Uh, we know that a lot of the jobs that have been lost during past recessions have been vulnerable to automation. And so a lot of those jobs that maybe didn't require a post-secondary credential, many of them may not come back or not come back at the level they were pre-pandemic. So I think this shift in the economy that we're experiencing right now definitely makes having a post-secondary credential um, even more important um, perhaps than even before the pandemic. So framing the problem up a little bit, you know, why has student debt become such a problem in the United States and here in Georgia? And often when I speak to lawmakers, especially if they're a little older or from a, a different generation, they don't quite understand the problem and the impact that student debt has today on students. Because they said, well, when I went to college, it was affordable, you know, I was able to work my way through and it was challenging, but I did it. So I don't understand why students today um, can't do it. And so we'll talk a little bit about some of the funding changes that have happened, but I wanna just start by asserting that um, one of the big major shifts that has happened is that the cost of higher education, we've really shifted as a society from being a shared responsibility where public colleges and universities are really well supported by tax dollars to shifting more of the cost to individuals who often cannot bear the full cost of education and then choose to borrow in order to be able to pay. And that higher education really we should understand is not only an individual private investment that has 
benefits for the individual, which people understand, but there are also a lot of community benefits to education and higher education. So we should all be invested in it. You know, there's lots of research that shows that higher education is better um, for, you know, not only individual, but community health, for family and community health and education outcomes, the communities with higher levels of education experience, you know, less crime, lower rates of incarceration, more individuals being involved with civic engagement. And so there are clearly a lot of reasons why we as individuals should be invested in the overall education levels in our communities. And the flip side of that also is we should also be concerned about the negative consequences of excessive student debt burden among, you know, thousands and thousands of borrowers in Georgia. Um, these are some of the major findings in research about how excessive student debt burden affects individuals. And, um, you know, just anecdotally, I, I know I said I wanted to bring data, but anecdotes are also a form of data and I think supports this. You know, we have a family friend that we know who during the past year or two of the student loan um, repayment pause was able to actually direct that money and save it to purchase a home for the first time. So, you know, we also see the flip side, I think, and we'll probably see some research coming out on what maybe happened with individuals who weren't making their student loan payments, but were saving that or using that in other ways. So the, the consequences of excessive student debt can definitely ripple out throughout the economy as well. Now, just to get a little bit into the weeds of sort of why we see student debt increasing, students borrow when they just don't have enough money <laughs> to pay for college. And college has gotten more expensive, you know, even prior to the last Great Recession. So I guess that's about, oh, I don't know, not that long ago. I mean, maybe 12 years now. Um, the, the state paid for 75% of the cost of higher education for students in Georgia, and students were responsible for that 25%. Since then, the student responsibility has actually doubled. So we, we saw rapid tuition and fee increases during their Great Recession. At the same time, the Pell Grant has not caught up. We'll talk a little bit about Pell Grant at the end at the federal um, portion, but just to preview one of the provisions in Build Back Better, which Congress is still debating, <laughs> is an increase in the Pell Grant uh, for students who attend nonprofit and public colleges. So, you know, when, when lawmakers say, or older folks say, like, I was able to work my way through college, that probably was true, but it's just not true anymore. Um, just some data and analysis I did here, as early as 2000, recent as 2001, if you had a full-time minimum wage summer job and took all those earnings and directed them to school, you could possibly cover tuition and fees at a university in Georgia. But today you would only be able to cover one semester. And it's also important to recognize that college is a unique period when students are expected to pay for education and support themselves at the same time. So they are using the same 24 hours in the day often to support themselves and pay for school. And they also are limited to jobs that they can get without a college degree because they're working on their college degree. So before they have the credentials, before they have the earnings, many students in Georgia are expected to go to school, pay to live, and also pay for school. And we know that more than 40% of students in Georgia cannot receive any financial support from their parents um, to help pay for college at all. And in fact, when I talk to students, many students themselves are financial contributors to their families. So they might be expected to help pay with the utility bill, or even if they're not contributing dollars towards utilities or rent, they're expected to help play a caretaking role for siblings or for older family members who may have health challenges. That's extremely common. Um, we definitely hear a lot about that. So this is the first point I'm gonna pause and check in with Jessica in our Q&A. Um, 
Jessica, I'm just curious if there's anything that I've covered so far that surprises you or, or resonates with you at all? Um, I mean, of course, no, nothing super surprising um, because, you know, we, we're knee deep in the the day to day realities of this work. But I, I think a lot of the things you said really resonate. Um, and, and it's just one of those situations where everybody has to take ownership for their part of this reality. Right. And so, you know, you mentioned cost of college right now. The most expensive college is University of Chicago, and it's eighty one thousand dollars. And so when we're talking about you know, Pell Grant and, and, and money that monies that are available for low income first generation families. We're, we're talking in, in, and then we think about what their average household income is, right? And so we're already kind of juxtaposing those two things for, for our most vulnerable students where it doesn't feel attainable, right? And, and so if you look at the most expensive college, colleges can make that number whatever they want it to be, right? And, and, it, and it's doubled over the last few years, as you mentioned earlier. Um, um, and, and so with, with Pell Grant not necessarily increasing, what happens is that a lot of families kind of go into this situation completely misinformed. And I think there's this attitude that you expect something to work out for financial aid. If you get accepted to that college, there's this little glimmer of hope that some university is going to care enough about you being on that campus, that the numbers are going to magically work in your favor. And that just doesn't happen for a lot of families. And so what we really try to focus on is the education and the awareness of that piece. We already know we have a FAFSA submission problem in Georgia. Our students are not submitting FAFSA until typically the second semester of their senior year. And so they're just seeing these numbers even for the first time in January and February, and they don't have enough time to figure out what the plan is to close the gaps in their financial aid packages. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, um, you know, that's so key. There is, there is such a lot of just lack of information, I think, about what college costs. And you're right. I mean, <laughs> you'll get the letter and there is a gap and there is a very large gap of unmet financial need for um, students in Georgia. I think the last I saw the average was per year. Well, I can't remember. It was maybe like $8,000. Don't quote me on that. But the, the, <laughs> the um, number aside is that there is an unmet financial need for students in Georgia. There is no magic, right? The university can't magically come in and just say we won't charge you this amount of money because you don't have it. I mean there there's there's a very large gap that many students experience in trying to pay for college. And so um loans become a place to turn and many students max out their loans, which also we'll talk about later. Loans are not unlimited. Um I mean they shouldn't be, I don't think, but um Loans are not unlimited. And so a lot of students max out their loans and still aren't able to help pay for college. So, so we'll uh, keep moving on. Feel free if you have any comments also to just put them in the chat as well. So just to ground us with a few like basic facts about student debt in Georgia, most college graduates in Georgia will carry debt, not all. A lot of non-graduates also carry debt. Um, because they may borrow and not finish. Um, the average debt burden for four-year students is quite high and has grown a lot over the past 15 years. Um, so just think about graduating from college and owing, you know, 28,000. And I know, again, everyone has a story. So there, you're, you're going to hear a $100,000 story. You're going to hear a $5,000 story. But this is this is the average and it's still, it's a significant burden for, for students. So um, the next couple of slides, I'm gonna look at differences in borrowing behaviors among students of different races and ethnicities. And this is a really key point of the presentation. So I wanna be very clear that these racial disparities are stark, they're real and they exist in Georgia and throughout the country. 
Um, this data here is focusing just on the university system of Georgia, which is our 26 public colleges and universities that the majority of students in Georgia attend. And you'll see that there's high borrowing rates among students of all races and ethnicities, but the highest borrowing rates by far are among our Black and African American students. And there are a lot of reasons for this rooted in, you know, generations of discriminatory policy that have resulted in a large racial wealth gap in Georgia and across the country. You know, when I talk to students, everyone wants to go to college, everyone has high expectations for themselves, for their families. Um, but you know, a lot of families and black families in particular and other low wealth families, even if parents or grandparents want to help contribute financially to college, they just can't in the same way that a lot of their higher wealth or white peers might. Um, so that is a reality here in Georgia. And we see that shake out in the data for sure. The next slide that I'm going to show you is looking at the individual colleges that have the highest borrowing rates. So you'll see that um, sort of that that trend play out at individual colleges. So in the first column, you'll see the highest borrowing rates, you know, greater than 90 percent of graduates borrowing. And the top three are Fort Valley, Savannah State and Alb Albany State, which are public HBCUs in the university system. So again, very high share of black undergraduates, very low median family incomes. Um, a couple of these schools, actually the schools serve, these schools tend to serve like a mix of both rural and urban students and um, pretty very low median family income and very high borrowing rates at these schools. I still, um, you know, I work with this state all the time and sometimes I still look at it and I'm like, it's still stunning to me, you know, <laughs> that um, the disparities and also, and also just like what people are trying to do on limited resources. Yeah, but um, Jennifer, one thing that I'm noticing is that Georgia State, which also has a high percentage of minority undergraduate students, is not on this list. But if you look at some of the really, really intentional financial aid in interventions that they have implemented to make sure, whether it's through the Pan Panther retention grants, that, that students who are the most vulnerable are able to stay on their campuses. I really think there's some promising things happening with some of our institutions that really could have a significant impact on these numbers. For sure, yes, and we'll talk about that. And I know that student debt is something that the university system definitely is looking at and wants to improve on. So it's something that they're definitely, um, you know, is, is something that's on their mind among many other things. <laughs> So the next slide, was, uh, the previous two slides were looking at borrowing rates. So what share of students were borrowing? This is looking at the amounts. So similar story here, the first column will show the highest, uh, the average cumulative loan amount among graduates who borrowed and the top three schools are again, Savannah State, Fort Valley State and Albany State. Um, you'll see a little variation here because the next school after that is Georgia Tech which is our highest priced institution in the university system, as well as being the college where the students that have the highest income tend to go. So um, also very low percentage of black undergraduates under enrolling at Georgia Tech. So again, like I said, the student debt story is complicated, um, but I think it's also important to recognize that $30,000 of debt for a student who's family makes $25,000 is a very different experience than $30,000 of debt for a student whose family makes $120,000. Um, that debt is just gonna be experienced very differently and impact their lives very, very differently. And, oh, I, <laughs> I should make my caveat because I always, um, I, I, I don't mean to seem hesitant about this, but I don't want this in any way to be a knock on our public HBCUs at all. I've written previously on the research and the good work that public HBCUs have played in the state historically. They've played a really, really important role in higher ed and are certainly very vital um, in their missions and how they serve students historically and today. So it's just the reality of paying for college and who 
these institutions serve that the numbers shake out in this way. But, um, you know, it's not a knock on those institutions at all. I want to talk a little bit about students who don't borrow, because you did see that there are, you know, about 40% of, of students in Georgia who choose not to borrow. And I think students who don't borrow also are very interesting. Um, and I've definitely talked to some of these students, um, particularly those who are attending technical colleges. And it's not that everyone who doesn't borrow can afford college. Many people who choose not to borrow cannot afford school. But there are um, many individuals just really, I think rationally for them and what is comfortable for them are very uncomfortable with taking on debt. And so research has shown that that is more likely to occur with students from immigrant families, older students, older adult students who um, are supporting their own families and don't wanna take on more debt. Um, along with immigrant families, a lot of Asian and Latinx students who um, might have a lot of financial need but are not gonna take on debt, um, are not comfortable um, working with financial institutions or have just seen family members, like that's just not something they do or they've seen like family members have bad experiences with that and so, they just don't mess with that. Um, that doesn't mean that they're having, you know, paying for college um, is easy for them. There are a lot of trade-offs that students are having to make. Um, I've definitely talked to students who will say, well, I'll go for a semester and then I stop for a semester, I'll work, I'll save, then I'll come back or people will go part-time. So um, there are definitely a lot of different decisions that students are making. So I'll pause here uh, to talk to you, Jessica. And I'm just curious if if you've seen this behavior sometimes with students you work with or just generally how are students approaching decisions about how to pay for college um yeah so and, and definitely want to acknowledge nympha's comment in the chat about how the the um, loan amounts the i guess the gaps look pretty close to the borrowing maximums uh i don't think that's an accident right uh i, I think that it, that it, it is designed specifically that way uh and, and so you know you talk about students that might be that averse but the reality is for a lot of our students they might not have an adult that will be eligible to take out a loan um their their parent or guardian may be ineligible for a number of reasons to actually qualify for a loan to be taken out and for them to get the maximum amount of money or they'll end up in a predatory loan bucket and that and to me that's even um, more dangerous and, and so you you hinted earlier at one of the challenges that we we can't ignore that a lot of these students are still financially responsible they're financially contributing to their household and I, I can't tell you how many students have what would we need I don't know as survivor's guilt saying, you know, I'm in college, but my brother, my little brother doesn't have food. And so it is that that urge to make sure that they're continuing to work and provide, right, that that forces them outside of that trajectory of, of being able to really fulfill the college experience. But what that leaves is that they have this kind of by semester mentality, as you said before. So I'm going to raise just enough money so my classes don't get dropped for this semester. And then I'll figure out what happens next semester. And that's when we see more students dropping out or take they want to take a semester off. But now you are working working and it's hard to break that cycle of having to work to kind of close those gaps and it's hard to get back into college and then I mean really my question is are we positioning them to be better off because if we have low-income first year integration students that have spent their two years or their four years working just a, not a career job not an internship towards their actual career goal like now they're they're graduating from college with no professional experience on their resume to prep them for the next phase of life so if we're saying that our goal as a state is to position students to help to you know graduate from college and help break cycles of poverty in their neighborhood we got to go back to the drawing board we really really do that's a great point and thanks for um whoever brought that up there are um many students as you said who who may not qualify for federal loans at all and we'll uh talk a little bit about that a little bit at the end also but even for students who do want to, want to borrow they may not be able to so all right we're going to see, I think, a little bit of this play out, the semester by semester approach in the next data slide, which I'm going to go to here. 
But in the next slide, I'm, I'm going to show you the lowest borrowing rates in the university system. So if we go to, um, again, borrowing rates are still pretty high across the board. I would say they're pretty high, but the lowest, the, the institutions with the lowest borrowing rates are Dalton State, Georgia Highlands, and South Georgia State. And um, Dalton State and Georgia Highlands College in particular have very high Latinx populations, students from immigrant families. And you'll see at the last column on the right, the average year to associate's degree at Dalton State College is nearly five years. At Georgia Highlands College is more than four years. So students are definitely making the trade-off um, to spend more time finishing their degree while they're working uh, to try to you know, keep going in their program um, while they're going to college. Another strategy, which I didn't mention before, but which I've definitely heard from students, and I'm sure you have too, is that students who are um, academically eligible to get into a competitive college, but cannot afford to pay for it, will decide to go to a college that is less expensive or closer to home, which they still may, may still be a good choice for them, but may not be the school, you know, the higher price schools tend to have more resources that they can put towards students' college experience. So uh, um, another strategy that we see a lot of students make is saying like, well, I got into, you know, whatever school, but then I decided to go to this school because I just couldn't afford it. And so, um, that can be a hard uh, decision for students to make as well. And then here you'll also see the, um, oh, sorry, go ahead. This slide didn't change, so I'm not sure if you were. Um... Oh, okay, I was just gonna point out here too at the bottom that the other schools that have relatively low borrowing are Georgia Tech and University of Georgia, which have, are um, expensive, but again, have students with, pretty high median family incomes. And now you'll see their average completion to a bachelor's degree is often shorter than for the other schools which have um, average time to an associate's degree. I wanna talk a little bit about the for-profit college sector, although that is not the focus. Oh, go ahead. So we're seeing, so we're not seeing the slides change. I think we missed that whole last chart that you were Oh, oh, okay. <laughs> Let me just start this again and see. Do you see a slide? I'm still seeing the debt of our students make trade offs. So. Oh, okay. Technical difficulties here. Let me just. Um, stop this share and start over. We seem to have gotten stuck in the meeting controls. But while I'm doing that, um, Jessica, if there's anything that you wanted to say about that. I think that, you know, financial aid education is such a critical, critical part of this conversation. I think that when you talk about students making decisions to, to take off or to go half time or to pick another school, I, I don't know that we're having enough of the conversation of what are the financial implications of all of those decisions. So if you decide to go from full time to half time, how does that change your overall financial aid package? And I know that there are some amazing organizations that are kind of doing that deep work. Um, I see a couple that have joined in on, on the call, but I wonder if it's happening too late in the pipeline for, for, a, for a lot of the students who really need this information throughout the state of Georgia. So and we've been working with a group of students that are part of a Title I school. They're seniors and they're, you know, if I ask every single one of them wants to go to college, right, there's, there's at least an idea or a notion that college is a possibility. I mean, we're in the Atlanta metro area. How many colleges can you get to on the Marta line right now. Um, I, I think that what happens is 
we'll engage with them with something like a financial aid quiz bowl. And I'll say, what did you learn? And if we're, if seniors are just learning about the FAFSA or just learning about the difference between loans and grants, um, we, we might want to think about really at spending more energy and resources on educating Georgia students about all of the financial implications of the choices that they make along their college pipeline. Yes. Um, I'm not having any luck. My Zoom seems to have frozen. And so I don't want to exit. Stories. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to um, stop the presentation, which I feel like is the only way if I came out and came back in that I could do it. So I'm just going to go ahead without slides, if that's okay with folks. Uh, that also means, Jessica, I'm just going to rely on you because I've lost like all my Zoom control, so I can't actually see the chat or the Q&A as well. <laughs> or you, I can only see my PowerPoint for some reason, but I'm just going to keep going. And we'll, uh, so if you let me know if there are any questions, we'll just keep going. I'm sorry that the slide is stuck. We'll just keep going. Um, so. I just want to talk a little bit about the for-profit college sector, because even though this presentation doesn't focus on that, I would be remiss in not mentioning it in a presentation about student debt. So the most important thing to know about for-profit colleges is that they are the sector that drives the worst student loan outcomes. So a lot of the really bad data that you see on default rates, for example, are really highly driven by the for-profit college sector. Uh, nationally, the default rates for students who start at for-profit colleges are four times higher than for students at private nonprofit or public colleges. So a lot of the really bad outcomes are, are mainly driven by the for-profit college sector. The other really important thing to know about for-profit colleges is that they are heavily enrolled by women in Georgia and by Black women in particular. So 72% of students at for-profit colleges in Georgia are women of any race and ethnicity and fully 44% of students in for-profit colleges are black women. So this is definitely an issue that affects a lot of black women here in Georgia. And it's something that I always just like to keep an eye on because almost every year in the legislature, a for-profit college, or frankly, I've just gotten contacted by colleges themselves, um, are look for ways to access public funds for their students. So by that, I mean, they're trying to get access to dual, the dual enrollment program dollars or other scholarship dollars that the college, that the state has made available to students. And I think we really need to be careful on having some level of accountability on colleges that are eligible to receive those types of funds. And then the last topic I'll go into before um, going into our policy recommendations and the federal uh, update is a program called SAL, Student Access Loans. So not a lot of people know about student access loans. It's a relatively small program, but it's actually a student loan program that the state runs. And Georgia is actually the only state that uses state funding every year and loans it out to students in the form of student loans. So every year for the past 10 years or so, Georgia has used at least $26 million of lottery funds and loaned it to students. And it's, it's pitched as a loan of last resort. It's a low, um, has an initial 1% interest rate. And in order to be eligible for it and the way many students find out about it is because they've run out of options. They've maxed out other loans or they don't have access to other loans. And so then they find out about Sal. Um, I, have I have serious concerns about the Sal program. I have talked to multiple borrowers who have had a lot of problems in the repayment process. And this is not, them having trouble repaying because they don't have the money to repay. It's because of administrative errors or burden on the on the part of the state. So until like literally this year, I think this year, the state has finally decided to put some money into Sal to help modernize their system. But I talked to people who 
you know, they were having to mail checks in and then call and make sure that people receive them and people wouldn't pick up the phone and people would lose checks and they're having everything, nothing was digital and everything was like very pen and paper. And so it really led to a lot of problems with um, students or students were getting different information, you know, from different individuals when they called. So there have been reported a lot of problems with that loan program. Loan programs in general, I think it's important to recognize are just um, much more complicated and expensive to administer than grants. It's much easier to give out a grant than it is to give out a loan and then collect on that loan for however many years afterwards for the state. Um, and so I think that that is, it's a problematic business for the state to be in, I think, to be loaning out lottery dollars to students in this way. The program does have loan cancellation options, but as we've seen, um, a lot of those programs do not reach a lot of people and are often pretty ineffective. I think there's a lot of good intention behind loan cancellation programs, but they just often don't reach borrowers and all, are also incredibly complicated to administer. So those are my sort of <laughs> warnings, I guess, about Sal and we've We've done some advocacy actually in sort of reforming that that loan program in order to convert it to grants. Um, Jennifer, if you want to make me a proposal so I can, I have the slides queued up, I can share maybe. Okay. Before you get to the policy recommendations. But one thing I just wanted to add, I guess, to that loan piece while we're making the switch over is that, I mean, like you said, I think since it started only 140 or 150 uh, students have gotten the actual loan forgiveness. And we see that on the federal level too. So it, it is, there are some changes that could be made, but they also don't talk about, you know, how that 1% jumps to 5% if you default or, or you know, there's a 6% late fee. And so there's other elements of it that definitely create more of, of a burden for students that are, are already kind of being blocked out of, of, this, of the whole financial aid system. That, yes, that's definitely true. And Jessica, I wish I could make you a co-host, but I am really locked out of everything in Zoom right now. That's okay. <laughs> so I'm just gonna keep going. Are there any questions right now before we go uh, end with the policy recommendations and the federal um, and the federal work that's been going on? Nothing in the Q and A. Okay. So in the last, um, this last bit of the presentation, I wanna talk about some of our state policy recommendations and then talk a little bit about advocacy with Jessica and then a little update on federal. So starting with the state policy recommendations, first of all, as you can probably tell, I'm really not a fan of the state being involved with loans to students. Um, and I know that that money is there for gets used for a reason because students don't have any other place to go. So my proposal is that we convert that student access loan program to grants. If the state is committed to um, funding that every year at $26 million, it would be in my view, much more effective and efficient to just convert student access loans to student access grants and um, give them to students who don't have anywhere else to turn after they've maxed out their other aid options. I would also love to see the student, the state expand some of the debt relief options in student access loans because there have been problems where students are getting financially penalized um, because of mistakes that the state have made and through no fault of their own. So that is another um, policy recommendation uh, from us. The other plank, I guess, of this is just to try to prevent students' dependence on loans in the first place. And we can do that by keep making sure our colleges and universities are funded at a level that they don't have to rely so much on tuition dollars, but also directing more scholarship and grant funding to students with financial needs. So we are one of two states in the country that do not have, that does not have a needs-based financial aid program. We give out a lot of dollars um, in non-need-based aid through HOPE scholarships and grants, but uh, no money 
based on a family's ability to pay for college. And I, I think that that is not right for Georgia. And that is definitely something we can fix and that we can change for students in the future. And last but not least, I think uh, just for the for-profit college sector, even though we don't do a lot of work on this, I always am just wary of this. I think that we need to make sure to create accountability for institutions that have bad debt outcomes for their students and just keep in, definitely keep an eye on, at the very least, keep an eye on which institutions we allow to access our public dollars um, for various scholarship or dual enrollment programs. So actually, before I get into federal, Jessica, um, I, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about your engagement in state policy advocacy, because I know you and I have talked before about needs space in particular, and that you've done some work and so um, on that. And so um, obviously, I, I do engage in, in a certain amount of advocacy as part of my work, but I wanted to see if you could share some of your experience in working in advocacy in, in your role as a nonprofit leader. Um, yeah, absolutely. I think that in all of the work that we do at the Scholarship Academy, I, I kind of approach it from the lens, like, what would it look like if financial aid didn't just happen to students in the state of Georgia? What would it look like if at every key intervention point students had the resources and tools that they needed to navigate to make educated financial decisions and then to really have the financial resources to graduate without them going into significant amounts of debt. Um, and so a lot of our work, you know, we start at the at the root, right? Let's just go all the way back to the beginning. You know, so we know that Georgia has a college and career performance index and it's measuring all these other ways that we can say whether or not school like schools are making sure that kids are ready for college careers, but there's no financial aid readiness metrics attached to that, right? And so what we're doing on the grass level is in, encouraging school districts and encouraging um, individual counselors to first be accountable on their lands and say, what is our goal around just FAFSA? We'll start with FAFSA. You know, we would love for every school to have a financial aid, culture building work plan. They're not all there yet, but we work with schools and partner organizations to really set some, some goals around increasing awareness, increasing confidence, shifting students' behaviors around the process, and hope to one day encourage um, on the state level for that college and career performance index to include a really specific measure around financial aid readiness for students, because we see in everything that you said, it's, it's, it's important. We have to have it in order for our students to be able to financially stay. Um, what we've been doing with universities, I mean, you know, if I'm, if I'm really causing a little trouble, I would say every university in the, the in the Georgia system should have should be transparent about what that ad drop balance is. So, what is the magic number that if I raise thirty thousand dollars, am I going to get sent home over fifteen hundred? Am I going to get sent home over over two thousand? And so, we've been able to work with some institutions actually just piloting some things, looking at. Um, where, where they gave students a semester grace period. So the students went through our course, our curriculum, and were proving that they were submitting private scholarship applications to raise money towards their education. And that for just that one semester, the university did not kick them out until they had that time to raise. So what if every university had a semester grace period where students are able to aggressively kind of close their gaps without the, without the threat of having to leave a campus they worked so hard to get access Access to. And, and so I think like some of those things, you know, our regular programming is around training and providing curriculum around scholarships, but now we're seeing this as how do we change, push the systems a little bit to do and th think differently about how we're approaching financial aid. And finally, we're working with local scholarship providers. And so one thing that we don't talk enough about is scholarship displacement. And so students who get, you know, money from the university, but they also get hope, right? We change those requirements where now in order to get the Zell Miller, you're already cream of the crop top where you're likely to get an institutional scholarship. And so instead of the universities reducing that money and you still having a gap, 
you know, what are the ways that we can work with, with like some of the local scholarship programs to spread the money out over four years, to really look at giving enough where the students don't get penalized for doing the hard work of raising money to fund their education. And so we've been quietly just, you know, poking here and there during the pandemic to see where we can have the biggest impact, but looking forward to collaborative partners to say enough is enough. It's time to do financial aid differently. That's great. I love hearing about that. Um, and I think you're right, like every organization has a role that they can play in sort of making things a little bit better in whatever area they touch. Um, and also, I will have to say that all of those institutional reforms and innovations are definitely something that state advocates like me look at when we're thinking about what to advocate for at the state level. So a lot of changes that we are looking at making statewide may have had some kind of seed and something that an institution was doing that was working well that could be perhaps spread throughout the system. Um, and I've also appreciated Jessica your advocacy on on need based I know that you've written op eds and other published other work that um, supports Georgia having need based aid here in Georgia for our students so I appreciate that as well. Um, okay, so I will go into, I just want to end with federal news because although I normally focus just on state, there's been just a lot of action with the federal government the past couple of years. So just doing a little bit of an update for folks, if it's helpful. So things that are happening right now with federal loans. So as we speak, uh, the Department of Education is trying to implement public service loan forgiveness waivers for students. So public service loan forgiveness is a program that you may have heard of where students who are involved in certain careers that are considered public service for and then make payments on their loans for 10 years were are able to qualify forgiveness for the remainder of their loan after making payments for 10 years. That is what the program was supposed to do. <laughs> um, it did not do that for the vast majority of borrowers. And um, I think more than 90% of borrowers did not end up getting public service loan forgiveness because of various factors. And, you know, I read a great quote about that. You know, if, if you have, you know, 4% of borrowers not qualifying for something, maybe they're doing something wrong. But if you have 90% plus of borrowers not qualifying, there is something wrong with the program. <laughs> it is not something that is wrong with individual borrowers. Um, there is something wrong with the design of the program. So they're currently trying to um, implement some waivers that will allow more borrowers to qualify for forgiveness. Um, there were just a lot of issues, like for example, a very common thing was that students were consolidating their loans and then you know if you consolidate in a certain way like it didn't count towards your 10 years of repayment just things that students had no idea and they thought that they were doing the right thing and it didn't work out for them so that's one thing that's going on right now um for those of you who are still paying repaying student loans this affects my family and probably a lot of yours <laughs> the student loan payments will restart on January 31st, 2022. So after um, an almost two year pause during the COVID-19 pandemic, um, the federal government has said that student loan payments will restart at the end of January. So that's definitely something to be aware of. And one other thing that the Department of Education is working on right now is rules changes to the income driven repayment plans that the Department of Education has. Income driven repayment is sort of an umbrella term for a couple of different loan programs that the federal government has um, that was supposed to sort of limit your loan payments to and instead of having a set amount every year be like a certain percentage of your income. And then after a long number of years, I think it was like 20 years would be able to forgive the remaining balance, but they're again, has not worked out quite as well as they hoped. And so they're looking at roles of trying to figure out how to make changes to improve the income-driven repayment programs. And then it seems like this is changing day to day, but Build Back Better, which is the big bill that has 
all of the different um, provisions in it related to, you know, childcare and pre-K and um, a lot of other good things that we care about here also has provisions for higher ed. There has not been very much reporting about what is in Build Back Better for higher ed, but I will um, go over the major provisions here today. One of the major provisions for higher ed is that Build Back Better, if Congress passes it, will increase the maximum Pell Grant by $550 to public and private nonprofit colleges and universities. This will, my understanding is, it be in addition to another almost $500 increase in the regular budget and appropriations. So the new maximum for Pell Grant should be between $7,000 and $7,500, depending on how it all shakes out for students. The big change in Build Back Better, which I'm really excited about, is that for the first time, Build Back Better will expand eligibility for Pell and other Title IV financial aid programs, including loans, <laughs> to participants in the DACA and TPS programs. So until now, um, individuals who were here um, on TPS or were participating in DACA or other undocumented individuals were not eligible for any type of federal financial aid, which caused, a, a, which was a really big barrier for a lot of students who wanna to go to college. And so this is gonna be a huge change for the undocumented community here in Georgia and across the country. If this passes and stays in, um, this will be a, a really big help to students who wanna to go to college. And then uh, the last thing that I will note that is, I think, of particular interest to folks in Georgia is that Build Back Better includes a $6 billion increase in funding to HBCUs, TCUs, and MSIs. Um, and that can also be used for needs-based aid. Georgia is home to, I mean, everyone knows kind of about, you know, the Atlanta University Center and sort of the big private HBCUs, but when we include MSIs or minority serving institutions, Georgia is actually home to 26 of these institutions that could potentially increase funding. And that includes technical colleges and four-year colleges that are eligible for that increased funding. So that can is also potentially a big boon to these uh, very important institutions in our state. There's also um, some money for grants to states and systems, not very much, frankly, uh, to improve student outcomes. And then there's also um, some dollars specifically for research and development capacity and infrastructure at four-year HBCUs and MSIs, which um, is also definitely um, needed and appreciated. So are there any questions about any of the federal proposals or changes. I'm not hearing anything. So I will just end by saying, first, thank you to Jessica for being a great conversation partner and partner in general in this work. Um, but then also encouraging you to really stay engaged. An easy way to do that is to sign up for our higher ed bulletin, but also just make your voices heard. There are, um, so many opportunities to get involved and make your voices heard at the state and federal level right now, reaching out to your lawmakers, um, writing op-eds or letters to the editor. Um, when I talk to lawmakers, both federal and state, they frankly just don't hear from a lot of people about higher ed. And so it will help increase the urgency and the profile, I think, of these issues if they hear from more folks about um, the reality of what students are facing and what we want. And some of this stuff is very, I mean, especially in the federal level is, um, you know, happening right now. So, you know, if Pell Grant is important to you, if Pell Grant eligibility for individuals in DACA is important to you, um, you know, please do reach out to your lawmakers um, and, you know, thank them for supporting it uh, or ask them to support it. And it's just good for lawmakers to hear from their constituents. So get your voices out there. And thank you very much for, for attending the webinar. Thank you.